evening, everybody. How are you all doing from everywhere where you are, anywhere in the United States? This is our Compass to MS Care Reaching Rural America program, and we are reaching rural America and beyond. And for those that have seen me in the past, you know that I start my programs wearing this mask because it's just a reminder of what is going on when I'm not wearing the mask. And again, for those that have seen it, I'm sorry, but you're just going to hear it again. For those that haven't, with these bright lights on, I can see the spray coming out of my mouth. All right? That's the spray that everybody's trying to tell you that by you wearing your mask, you're protecting those around you. All right? And for those that are not wearing masks that you're speaking with out in the street or at a store or wherever you are going, and if they're not wearing a mask, all right, then their spray that's coming out of their mouth is going into your face, okay, whether it be your eyes or your mouth or up your nasal passages or whatever. And if they're infected by anything, you're going to get that infection as well. So, again, that's just a simple reminder for that, all right? Now, I'm taking this off because there is nobody around me right now, all right? Later on, we're going to have Paul Pelland here. Paul will be at the front of the room. He'll be speaking live from my location. Meanwhile, Dr. Sam Hunter will be coming on in a short while, and he will be speaking with you about the topics that we have for tonight's program, which I'm sure you all know about already, and I'm not going to review again and again. Tonight's sponsors, we have Santa Fe Genzyme, we have Genentech, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Novartis, and I'm sure you could see them on the screen behind me, and so let's give them a virtual round of applause. Thank Yay! Thank you. Thank you for doing this, okay? All right. For those that don't know and not sure about what program you're watching, this is an MS Views and News educational program. We were very fortunate when the pandemic began, all right? We're not fortunate that, that the pandemic began, but we were just fortunate that we already knew how to do virtual programs. We've been doing them already for a couple of years. So once we, once we had this problem where we didn't know if we were going to show up at a location or not in the middle of March, we said, why don't we just make this a virtual event? And boom, it was just done, you know, overnight. Overnight. It was just very easy to do. So for tonight, you know, after tonight, again, Dr. Hunter is going to be on first tonight. He's running a little bit late, so I'm just talking to you for a few minutes. All right. September 1st, next week, we have our MS Neuro TV program. All right, that was actually our very first virtual series that we began. On September 3rd, we are going to be doing MS Views Now, which is COVID-19 and multiple sclerosis, the latest updates. Everybody that can come online, whether you've ever been part of the series or not, you can be part of that program. And speaking at that program on September 3rd is Megan Weigel. All right, then on September 15th, we were supposed to be in Dallas, Texas, but we cannot be. So we're going to do it from here, and we're going to have our speakers online as well. Okay, we got um, Dr. Annette Okai and a, uh, a personal trainer or a physical therapist. I don't remember his exact title, but his name is Travis, and he's in the Dallas area, and he will be on here speaking as well. Then on September 22nd, and we just put this one together in the last 24 hours, we're going to be doing a program. What we were supposed to be in Mooresville, North Carolina, but we're going to have Jill Kramer. Jill Kramer is a doctor from the Roanoke, Virginia, Christiansburg, Virginia area. She's going to be on the line on a webinar speaking with us, and we will also have Jeff Siegel that night. All right. Then on October 8th, just giving you all the rundown now instead of at the end of this program. On October 8th, also just developed in the last 24 hours, we're going to actually go to Columbus, Ohio. And we're going to do a hybrid event from Columbus, Ohio. We're going to have Dr. Aaron Boster speaking from there. We're going to have a small audience in a very large meeting space. Okay, and we're going to be very socially distanced. Four people at a table, 15 feet apart. Everybody there will be very safe to be there. Okay, but everybody in our virtual audience will be able to see this program as well. Again, it will be a hybrid program. We've done a couple of these since this this. Un since these uncertain times began, and fortunately, they've all been successful. So we will have Dr. Aaron Boster speaking live on October 8th from a live location in Columbus, Ohio, and it will be a virtual event as well. A week later, 
planned for quite some time is our MS Symposium. And by far, this has always been our largest event of the year, okay, with having two to 300 people live in person and another 300 people virtually online. Again, another virtual event that we've been doing for a long time. And speaking at that program are great voices, great doctors. We have Dr. Ben Thrower from Atlanta. Dr. Mitzi Williams from Atlanta, Dr. Aaron Boster from Columbus, Ohio, Paul Pelland, who you'll hear tonight and who's also speaking that night, and then we also have Rick Harris, who's a psychologist, who will be speaking as well. Okay, so then you got the rundown on all of that. So let's just introduce Dr. Hunter. He is from Franklin, Tennessee, okay, and Dr. Hunter is ready to speak with you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm sorry for the slight delay. It's traffic and, and a small child. So um, the I am going to walk through what is my first presentation for MS Views uh, online, and it's going to be very interesting. So we're going to talk a bit about MS and what's uh, currently going on. But I am, I like humor, uh, and, and when it comes to MS, it is all in your head, but not your imagination. Um, you know, we're going to speak today about what are, are the different types of MS, and uh, basically, um, the, you know, what those terms mean. We're going to talk about what it means to say to be in relapse, recovery, and how you treat your MS. Um, the... Um, Good thing is, is there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of ideas that you can get from other people and specialists. Um, uh, we're hoping that you that you learn um, how to uh, access this kind of care through the world and learning how to uh, use your resources. Um, Online it has some advantages. It also has some disadvantages. We'll talk about some of those and we'll wind up with a talk about COVID-19, which is uh, an interesting uh, and sometimes tragic development um, and how that affects you with your MS. Um, if I can get the, uh, I can get it to advance. It doesn't want to let me advance the slides. Here we go. All right, well, let's talk about first what the different types of MS are. Let me get this, erase the drawing. Okay, very good. The, uh, the important thing is uh, when it comes to, uh, to MS, um, I'm trying to get it to let me, uh, there we are. There is a beginning and we call that the first event. The very first thing that clearly is an MS symptom that people notice. And that's the beginning of MS for about 85% or more of MS patients. There's an event that occurs that gets people's attention. The remainder of people have a problem appear so slowly they can't say when it started. And it's generally gait or a cognitive uh, impairment that's slowly getting worse. And uh, these are distinctly different and by far and away people have a well-defined event, which we call clinically isolated syndrome. And the people who come to the doctor who clearly have impairments but can't tell us any history of well-defined events we call primary progressive MS. They generally have spinal cord lesions. The people who began with a first event, it's usually a uh, impairment in one eye, sometimes both eyes, a spinal cord problem, which is usually numbness or weakness or balance issues or bladder and a couple limbs, or the brain stem, which usually involves double vision or dizziness and sometimes sensation in the face. and can affect the limbs as well. So relapses don't usually occur in primary progressive MS when you're watching these people on rare intervals, but they do occur. Um, relapse or MRI changes happen all the times in people who've had events. And in fact, 90% of people will have a relapse or an MRI change within two years. And we call those people relapsing or remitting MS. They're often called clinically definite MS even before they're called relapsing or emitting MS because it's seen that they change on MRI. And uh, those many times at the very first MRI, about a third of people 
will be called definite MS. But clinically isolated syndrome can be called definite MS nowadays and often is. People who get worse slowly after, usually after years of regular new events, uh, have a slow worsening pattern we call progressive. Pro progressive disability is different than disability progression. Everybody with MS has disability progression. Progressive disability means you can't tell when you got worse, but they still have relapses sometimes that are more uh, well-defined. And those people are called active secondary progressive MS. Uh, people who um, people who are on relapsing uh, progressive uh, patients are people who are called progressive, but you see a relapse once in a while. They act that way. The majority don't. On average, about one in five people in the space of three years who have primary progressive MS, if you watch them very, very closely, they'll have a relapse. And they're not supposed to do that according to how it's defined, but it does happen. And those people used to be called, we used to routinely call people relapsing progressive MS. Now we just call them primary progressive MS. Active secondary progressive MS is, is at some point called inactive. It depends on who you ask as to how much this occurs. That means they no longer have any relapses. There's no relapses or MRI changes for years off treatment. This is actually pretty uncommon. And although people are often said to be inactive, when you watch them carefully, they're not inactive. And so the important thing to understand is uh, really for practical purposes, everybody who has progressive MS has active secondary progressive MS or primary progressive MS, which may be called inactive if it's not changing very so the, if this is confusing, you should imagine how confusing it is to the doctor to figure out what to call you. So for practical purposes, we start treating people like they're relapsing or remitting MS unless they're really clearly primary progressive MS. And there's outstanding amounts of information that people should be treated from the very first symptom of MS as long as they have some kind of abnormality on an MRI. Uh, and, and so pretty much almost everybody who has clinically isolated syndrome gets treated very early now, now, nowadays. And they're considered active secondary progressive MS unless there's really substantial long-term information to say otherwise. Now, what do you do it, when you want to define these events like relapses? A relapse is technically a new or recurrent impairment that's due to MS lasting more than 24 hours. So that doesn't include breaking your leg because you were clumsy, but unless you were clumsy because of the MS being worse and then you broke your leg. It's really in practice very hard to have more than three relapses a year because they usually last far longer than 24 hours and may slowly improve over many months. One of the things that's hard to understand about a relapse is it doesn't necessarily done until it's been stable for a long time and it doesn't always go away. But relapses can be different kinds of severity. They can be mild, which is non-disabling. It can be a minor sensation change, even a painful one. Uh, and the pain doesn't indicate how bad the problem is. A more severe sensory change would be like you can't feel the limb or you can't use the limb because of the sensation. Uh, vision changes or vertigo are often also mild uh, relapses, especially mild double vision or mild visual impairments on one side. A moderate impairment, something is disabling enough to need treatment, and it's one that we look at and we want to avoid it getting any worse and we're often going to treat it. A severe relapse is one where someone's unable to care for themselves, needs major assistance, is not walking or, or some similar kind of intervention is required. And there are life-threatening relapses. These are fortunately very, uh, very rare, but they, but they do occur. They occur in neuromyelitis optica more often than MS. But, the, but people can have severe or even fatal relapses from MS. It's one of the benefits of treatment is making severe things much more mild.
All right. So we say someone is recovered from a relapse when they're stable for at least 30 days. And many times you will talk to someone 30 to 60 days and they'll say, I'm not better. Are they better? Well, when you examine them and look at them, they're better, but they go on improving many times for months. After a year, they're probably not going to get any better from wherever they are. And we also will say a relapse is over when another relapse begins. So it's it's um, very common that that uh, patients come in and say, um, I'm not over my relapse and they're over their relapse. They just didn't return to their former level of function. So many times MS is like going down a set of stairs more than it's like sliding down a hill or being on a bumpy road you don't necessarily come back. And this is another reason why disease modifying therapy is very important because your likelihood of recovering is far, far higher from a relapse if you're on treatment and the relapses are milder than if you're not on any treatment at all. It's a huge liability not to be on treatment. Um, we do use corticosteroids, very high dose IV or oral corticosteroids, small dose packs are insufficient and inappropriate to treat a relapse and often lead to more serious relapses. Um, repository corticotropin, what's generally called ACTH or Actar gel, and there will soon be another product on the market called Synactin. Uh, that is a similar product that is uh, that is, uh, is synthetic rather than biologic are also alternatives. They're very expensive. They're generally reserved for people who can't take corticosteroids or who have failed to respond repeatedly to corticosteroids. Plasma exchange and IV immune globulin are usually used for severe relapses when people have failed another effective treatment like corticosteroids or repository corticotropin or have life-threatening relapses. And plasma exchange is usually what is used in that situation. This is the same process by which people donate plasma at a blood bank. They take your plasma out, they replace it with some protein, it removes some of the immune signals and antibodies which might be contributing. It works about half the time. So rehabilitation is used for people who don't quickly recover or fail to respond. And especially this is beneficial if people are having trouble with walking, swallowing or coordination where a therapist will work with them. All right, in, in other kinds of treatment for MS, we talk about disease modifying therapy. These are all the brand name drugs and now increasingly generic drugs that are out there. Um, they reduce the brain injury you don't notice. They prevent things from happening. The benefit is largely from these treatments. Uh, what never happens, what you don't see happen and what you don't notice. Uh, there are some of our stronger medicines that are more likely to improve some people. Tysabri and Lemtrata are the drugs that are more likely to improve people than other drugs, although Ocrevus and Jelinia often do too. Um, and people can improve on any medication. In fact, the worse their MS is, the more likely they have a chance of improving. Symptomatic therapy refers to alleviating symptoms. These include stress, sleep, pain, fatigue, stiffness of limbs or bladder problems. And, and we have lots of treatments uh, that doctors are skilled in applying for these. They do not fix the problem in the nervous system. They make it better. Um, I did leave off here one for walking. We actually have two drugs now that work for walking. So the way to look at your MS is it's a lot of different problems, but it's one illness. There are things you feel and there are things with your function. Uh, fatigue, I think, is the thing that people complain about the most. Generally, they mean the tiredness, but they can sometimes mean concentration or motor strength. And those are different. Um, the the difficulty uh, do, doing the normal things that you want to do is in part the amount of effort it's like having a bad night's sleep or a bad time uh you know after surgery or the flu vision and concentration are uh, two other common abnormalities the vision is not usually so severe that people cannot 
see, but it, the impairments slow them down and cause them to see less well. Concentration, it's the same thing. Something that will get anybody's attention is a tremor in their hands. They range from very small ones to very large ones. And not only tremor, but clumsiness of a limb is very common. Slowness of a limb is very common. And of course, gait-related issues. Gait problems are usually considered a hallmark of MS because this long pathway from the brain to the bottom of the spinal cord is very likely to get injured so much so that our disability scales are very heavily weighted towards gait impairments. Uh, pain is actually something that at one time people didn't say was related for MS. Uh, they often uh, forgot about it. Uh, trigeminal neuralgia is actually one kind of pain that's almost always associated with MS in younger people. Um, the uh, other kinds of nerve pains may present a little bit of diagnostic uncertainty if they show up in some ways. They tend to mimic uh, other kinds of neurological problems. And uh, th there are just many kinds of uh, problems like muscle stiffness and spasm and bladder issues that are also due to spinal cord impairments. People like to talk about invisible symptoms. As a neurologist, I'm a little bit uh, happy when people say nobody can see I'm ill because that means we're doing a good job or they're not badly effective. And fatigue itself, when it's a mental, uh, mainly just a feeling, what we call a lazy feeling or lassitude, it does not indicate the severity of the disease. In fact, some people with very severe disease don't have fatigue. Um, sensation abnormalities like tingling or, or a uh, funny pain or a um, pleasant uh, response to light touch do not usually indicate severity as pain doesn't. Mood problems are very widespread. The inflammation in the nervous system affects your mood. It causes your immune cells to suck up the chemicals that tell you everything's okay. Vertigo can be a very tiny problem in the nervous system. Things that generally do indicate severity are really problems processing information, thinking, word finding, and bladder issues, because these are impairments in, law, in important pathways. Of course, things that are obviously impaired, like your gait or your coordination, are more significant. So visible things like vision, balance, strength, gait, uh, tremor, and coordination and, and speech, actually making speech. We're not talking about trouble searching for words. We're talking about slurred speech or sounding like you're drunk or have marbles in your mouth. These are pretty significant symptoms that uh, impairments. Since we've been treating people aggressively, these impairments are far worse and far less worse and much more delayed than they used to be. And so this is a really huge achievement compared to 30 years ago when we called MS relapses attacks and that people would be disabled in six to 10 years and unable to walk. And this is a world of difference that's due, brought to you by our friends in the high priced pharmaceutical business and increasingly less. Let me, let me go back here a little bit. Um, so I'm going to switch gears now and talk to you about uh, some of the newer medicines that are disease modifying medicines that you may not have heard about. Most people have heard about interferon beta, you know, the ABC, E, EP drugs are drugs. You know, um, their interferons have been around a long time. They're good drugs. A lot of people can't take them or don't want to do injections. But there are many newer drugs, and there's, there are several oral drugs that are out many years. I want to talk about the newer ones you may not have heard about that are a little bit different in some ways. Uh, Mavenclad or cladribine is a drug that's been studied for 30 years for multiple sclerosis, and it was finally approved last year in the United States after uh, 10 years after the original application because the government finally got all their, their ducks in a row. It is a low, low dose of a drug that was originally used to treat a rare form of cancer. And it, it goes after the problem. It modifies the disease in the long term. So after only four weeks of treatment spread out over 14 months, uh, people go many years, 75% of people will be free from relapse for six to eight years. 
The government won't even let the, tell, uh, the company tell you how good the drug is. They will tell you that um, the other things about it that are the negatives for the drug. It's a pill. It is given in a, in a weight-based dose. Uh, it used to be given IV for MS many years ago. It's extremely effective. It's, it's basically 20 days of treatment over 14 months, one or two pills a day for a total of 20 days. It can be as few as 16 days if people are smaller. It does not cause major side effects, although some people will, a very small fraction of people get significant low blood counts, a rash or nausea. Shingles is a very small risk, but it is outstandingly effective. Now, it was only tested in people who were naive to treatment uh, or had had a single treatment for MS. So there's not much known. One out of 300 people had a cancer. This is about one in 600 actually different than the inactive group. Um, and about a fifth the risk of having a cancer in a clinical trial in Jelenia and a tenth the risk of Tecfidera. So it, it, although it's got a cancer risk label, this cancer risk is really quite small compared to other MS trials. It has got a very well-deserved label for risk in pregnancy. It is safe enough to breastfeed 10 days after you've had the medicine. So that's how quickly it's out of your body for sure. But people should use contraception for six months. And if you have a slowly recovering immune system, you can delay the, the second half of the treatment that's given a year later uh, for six months. There's other medicines that are like Jelenia that are S1P modulators that have come. They do not repair the problem, they control it. It's very important if you're on one of these medicines right now, they're Jelenia, um, uh, uh, so it was Sopotamod, uh, Mazent, and the newest one, Zaposia, that you do not stop these medicines without another plan for your MS because they are holding back the flood of immune cells. And when they wear off, your, your MS can get transiently very much worse. So you wanna always have another plan ready to start when you discontinue these medicines. Jelenia is one, it's now approved for children, uh, which usually means in medicine 16 and 17 year olds, there are newly identified risks of rare serious infections in this family. One in many thousands of people will get an unusual serious infection. Uh, seizures also occur. They occur in up to 2% of adults and 10% of children. There's this risk of severe reactivation of MS when you stop the drug without going on some other treatment. Um, Mazent or Saponamod is a newer version of these drugs. It has very clear benefit in progressive MS. In fact, even in inactive progressive MS or active secondary progressive MS that hasn't had a relapse in the immediate past, uh, they are active. It has some complicated metabolic issues and medication interactions that have to be reviewed with you. There's a blood test that you do to see what the dose is. Um, there are benefits of this drug on mental processing speed. The newest member of this family is called Zaposia or Xanamon. It is the simplest one of these medicines. It also does not require a first dose. It does not have such a complicated metabolism. You need blood tests. It is good for cognition. If you have no heart or major eye issues, you can start it right out. Uh, there are less blood abnormalities with this medicine. So that's one of the benefits of Zaposia is it's much simpler and many people are using that as the first drug for their MS now, since it was approved just a few months ago. Now, you may have heard about drugs like Tecfidera and they are twice daily medicine. They are called methyl fumarates. The first generation was called Fumiderm. It was used for psoriasis in Europe, never approved in the United States. The second generation was Tecfidera, which is going generic as we speak. You, know, you will probably get letters before the end of the year from your insurance company telling you they're switching you if you don't uh, have a good reason to take the brand name drug. Uh, the trouble with this family of drugs is, is between 10 and 25% have some kind of GI symptoms that are a problem. There's a very small risk of PML and other rare opportunistic infections. In general, 
if you're taking medicine for your MS, your MS is a much bigger risk than the rare, uh, these rare serious infections. This is not like Ty Sabri, where your risk basically goes up 1% a year of getting one of these life-threatening infections. This is a risk that's smaller than your risk of dying, uh, driving to see the doctor. And so these are not reasons not to take the medicines. Uh, they appear to slowly cull these overactive lymphocytes that damage the brain. There is a third, two third generation drugs. One's called Lumerity, uh, which, and one's called the Fear Tam uh, that have been approved. Uh, these drugs have better GI profiles than, than Tecpidera and Fumiderm. They have virtually no GI distress, especially if taken with food. They have minor flushing issues. I would say they have none if taken with a meal. Um, generally, uh, you're not supposed to take it with a very large meal, but you can take them. All right, controlling spasticity. Uh, if you haven't heard about botulinum toxin and you have significant spasticity in your legs or arm, you need to see somebody about this if you haven't got uncontrolled. This has changed completely our ability to control difficult spasticity. Botox was available for many years, but the doses were low. There's a drug that's related called Dysport that's now available at very high doses and can really address major large muscles that are getting in your way that make your leg or your foot too stiff. Um, they will not make you stronger, but they will make you less stiff so you can work around the stiffness. Um, and, and it's possible to even treat several limbs at once and improve severe leg spasticity to improve people's walking. The more you walk, the better you're going to do. And the biggest benefit is avoided a lot of baclofen pumps, which while they're effective, many people are too weak. And when you make them really relax their muscles completely, baclofen relaxes all the muscles and then they can't stand up. There is a new drug that's coming to control spasticity called r baclofen ER. <clears throat> it will be marketed as Antinua once the FDA approves it, probably by the end of the year. It has more benefit than baclofen. It lasts longer, and it has less sedation and toxicity than baclofen and tizanidine. It's a very big improvement, the first new real drug in 25 years oral drug for spasticity. So what is the future of MS? It's really enhancing repair and function. Repair happens a lot in MS. People underestimate how much repair goes on and people who are on treatment get a lot of repair. They may still have symptoms, but things look better in the brain. And some of our medicines, especially our highly effective ones are associated with repair. I've done lectures on that that you can watch on the MS News website or, or YouTube channel. There are trials underway to improve walking with high dose of antidine that have finished and actually shown effectiveness. You can, you can get these drugs. They're approved for Parkinson's disease already. The prior drug to enhance walking is now uh, gone from brand name to Dalfampardine. And you may hear next year about possible new, new strategies uh, if the trials are successful at improving people. If someone wants to be in an experimental trial, we have more trials than ever before to do this. We'd love to hear from you if you're in our area. So how do you get to, to these specialists you need? Well, it depends on where you are and what the resources are in your area. Sometimes you end up doing things for yourself. Sometimes you end up having to go to three doctors four doctors, five doctors, sometimes it's all at one stop. Depends on what the resource is. When you have lower disability, you can do more for yourself. It's very important to keep a, a, appropriate, um, a appropriate mindset about your MS. The glass half full, the things you can do, it won't fix you but it makes life much smoother and it's good for your immune system. Learning to control your fatigue, learning to be healthy, uh, these things have clear benefits on your disease pattern. Cognitive monitoring, there are a number of strategies out there. 
uh, to keep track of what you're able to do. I find many times people overestimate their impairments because the amount of effort that it takes to do things. They say, I'm terrible, and you test them, and they're above average. Um, well, they may used to have been better than that. You know, and they do have some impairments, but they can certainly uh, find ways to function. So it's it's important to monitor and know what you're good at and what you're bad at. If you're bad, if your memory is terrible, don't rely on your memory. Have a system and an organization. Then then you can get around. That's how everybody functions when they're over 60. If you're 40 and your memory is bad, well, you've got some challenges, but there's a strategies for getting around that. And if you, if you look around, you'll find these ideas. Exercise is really good for fatigue, any kind of exercise, but especially using your legs. Vision, uh, you can monitor. There's many ways to monitor. There's apps you can get on your phone to monitor your vision. Um, primary care is really important. Uh, I, always, I always groan inwardly when I find out somebody's using an urgent care as their primary care. They don't get everything done for maintaining their health. Uh, all the common health problems that people get as they get older are really disastrous for um, people with MS. It makes their disability much worse. Uh, gaining weight, having high blood pressure, having uncontrolled diabetes, having uncontrolled lipids, all these things are disastrous. Uh, not getting your immunizations for pneumonia or the flu or shingles can lead to really big setbacks. Uh, and it so happens the statin medications, <coughs> excuse me, which, um, which are used to treat cholesterol have a very good track record in MS for preventing disability. In fact, some of the best medicines, medical strategies are to, to treat these. We just don't know the best doses to use for MS yet but that's under research. As far as diet, although there are people who claim to have magic diets, there really isn't a magic diet for MS. There are healthy diets and there are unhealthy diets, which generally considered heart healthy is a pretty good diet. Low sugar, and that extends to starch, salt, and grease. If you, if you keep those things low, you're, you're eating pretty healthy. Um, as far as supplements, the three most important ones are vitamin D3, omega-3 fatty acids, and lipoic acid. And if you're allergic to seafood, you can get your omega-3 from non-seafood sources uh, also. But these are very, they all make the immune system work better and protect the brain. And they're good for the rest of your health. If you have higher disability, you have more challenges. There are some real specialists that you may need. Um, a low vision specialist is usually an optometrist who can train you to be more effective in seeing things, even if you have very poor vision. They can teach many people how to drive who wouldn't be able to drive. Um, as far as the bladder goes, urologists today can get anyone dry. I would encourage people to avoid at all costs bladder stimulators. They, do, they first of all, my experience is they don't work well for MS. And second of all, they interfere with spine MRIs. You cannot have a spine MRI. All the, and they can do a head MRI, but it's not as good as most places can do for MS. So avoid these bladder stimulators. A lot of doctors try to put them in as a solution for bladder incontinence or, or uh, incomplete emptying. And they almost always interfere with your care in other ways. Spasticity, uh, if, you, if you, your neurologist is not an expert in that, the physiatrists, which are call, also called physical medicine, which you have to look very hard for, are very good at this. They also do botulinum toxin injections, as many neurologists do, um, and infrequently someone actually needs surgery, and physiatrists are a little better at recognizing and referring those people than neurologists are. In primary care, we discussed that as far as rehabilitation therapists, the people who are called occupational therapists generally work with your hands and cognition. Physical therapists usually work with your ambulation and your balance. And speech therapists work with your swallowing and communication. So if you have limited resources in the community, how do you get help? And my first advice is you drive or you get on a plane and you go see somebody who knows how to get you the help. Uh, this is a very successful strategy in many locations. 
And believe it or not, it's far more effective and doctor's advice are cheap than trying to help yourself unless you're really lucky and you don't need that kind of specialized help. The MS Society in some places and is very helpful. Um, you know, if you need to know about Barry Singer and his COVID uh, webpage, Barry Singer's also got a lot of the good stuff. Aaron Boster has a lot of good stuff. MS Use does. The MS Foundation has some good information, and so does the MSAA. You're going to have to look around. If you get to a website that says you need to get a stem cell uh, treatment, just move on. It's it's they're just after your money. All right. Red flags. When you see a doctor. And he says these things to you about MS. This is not some place you want to stick around. I don't change medicines. I don't ever use that medicine. I don't need those medications. If the doctor doesn't check you from head to toe and your eyes and limbs and coordination, and watch you walk on a regular basis, this is not a doctor you need to be seeing. If there is a problem and uh, there's no neurologist overseeing the PA or NP, this is not a practice you can stay at. You're gonna have to find somebody who, who can sort things out. Now, there are some very good PAs and NPs who do MS, but you've gotta have some neurology oversight. They don't have all the experience or know everything. And other problems arise in people with MS, other neurological problems, other physical problems. And you don't want these problems to get accidentally uh, ascribed to the MS and not get treated in a timely fashion. So let's stop and uh, switch gears here and talk about COVID. COVID is, um, if it was any other year and it was called the flu, it would be a really bad flu. It's a little different than the flu in many ways, but it's very similar in others. But how has it changed MS care? Well, one of the good things about MS is people don't usually die from the flu with MS until they're very, very old. And why that is, we don't know, but it's not been a big problem. In fact, I'm trying to think in 30 years if I've ever had an MS patient die of the flu. I don't think so. Um, have some MS patients died from COVID? They certainly have. In the worst of the epidemic in Europe, the death rate of hospitalized MS patients was about 4 to 5%, which is about half of everybody else. MS patients tend to have very few viruses when they're older and a whole lot worse ones when they're, when they're a child. And so since most of you are no longer children, you can kind of relish in that fact. Now you can get very sick with this virus and even young people can have serious complications. One of the things that's been a big problem after people have COVID is blood clots. Um, and they can, MS patients are prone to blood clots in their legs and those can create life-threatening problems. You may have done a telemedicine visit. Telemedicine is not a very effective way to manage MS. It is a good temporary strategy. You know, it's a good way to check and see if there's anything going on and refill medicines, but it is in no ways a good substitute. You need to be prepared for a telemedicine visit. If you don't, it will not be an effective visit. You need to get to the doctor safely if you're going to go to the doctor. Uh, you need to know how to use hand sanitizer. We'll talk about masks here in a little bit. Uh, make sure you know what you need to do uh, when you see a doctor by telemedicine because they're very short visits. Many times um, the doctor is very distracted. He doesn't have as much help as he should when he's doing a telemedicine visit. And I'll tell you, a good 10 minutes many times go into just getting people so where you can see people and hear people. And then they often haven't done any of the things. They don't have their medication list. They didn't send it in. You've got, to, you've got to be organized. Your healthcare will not be effective if you are not organized about it. Protect yourself, protect yourself, protect yourself. Uh, you get these viruses from people. If you're not real close to people, then you're not gonna get it. Uh, three feet, a minimum distance. I recommend that you do wear a mask when you're out there with non-family members. Uh, uh, and that you stay three feet away from people. If you can't do that, you can also get a face shield. Face shields are also additive and effective. <clears throat> In small spaces, people are more likely to get infected. Big spaces, outdoors, very unlikely to get infected. In fact, it's practically impossible. Uh, transient immune weakness, 
people worry about a lot in MS with the highly effective medicine. I'm going to talk about that here in a moment. It's not really as big an issue as, as, as some people have put forth. Um, I think you need to keep a positive attitude. You need to think about what's going right in life. Um, you know, boring is better than sick, you know, and so, so if you're, if you've been well, that's fine. I, we've had a number of patients have COVID with MS and do just fine. It's a week or 10 days of misery, but they do fine. And some have had some medical complications afterwards. Uh, this is really not a new problem for us in medicine. Doctors are, have more trouble trying to figure out how to follow what the government wants, which is many times divorced from what good medicine is, uh, than they do with knowing how to manage sick people. We've been dealing with infectious disease forever. All right, so telemedicine is really not a substitute for a hands-on exam, or it's a bad substitute. Um, I'm trying, I'm going backwards, and I just wanted to make that. Send your insurance or your medications and vital signs in advance. Make sure you're working internet video and someone is there to help you. It's really helpful if somebody can direct the camera so that someone can watch you walk in the space and see how your balance is because they can't do uh, enough to assess you. And try not to go more than a few months without seeing the MD. Um, Age, chest, and heart conditions are really the big risk. MS is not an extra risk. The risk of dying from COVID, when you get it seriously, is similar to the risk of dying from Tysabri. So I have a lot of people who are on Tysabri, which is not an additional risk from COVID. It's a risk of getting PML. What's your risk? About 1% for every year you're on Tysabri. So the risk of dying from COVID is very similar to the risk from Tysabri, and most people who take Tysabri like it so much, they don't, they don't care. And COVID is the same. That doesn't mean you should be cavalier about it. The next person you give COVID to might die from it, you know, if they're an older person. Half the people who've died of COVID are over 80 years old. One of the things that unfortunately people don't tell you is that cloth masks don't work well really don't work well. They must seal tightly and have 12 to 16 layers of linen or cotton. Most of them have three or four. Um, and, and so if there was really one rec recommendation I have to protect yourself, it would be use a KN or N95 mask. They are far, 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 far more effective. A KN95 mask and a glass shield, a glass, if you wear glasses, you're, you're fine. They fog up a lot, but a, a face shield, those two things are very effective along with hand sanitizer. And that's what KN95 masks look like. If your mask doesn't look like that, it's not a very effective mask. Now, surgical masks are, which are the next most common one that's often used, are also good, but they're not as good as an N95. Masks with a valve stuck in the middle of it don't protect everybody else. It will protect you, but not everybody else. Hand sanitizer uh, will help you. If you are in a house where someone is ill, either they leave the house or you leave the house, you will get sick if you are in a house with a sick person. This has been looked at. Masks don't help. There is no way you can protect yourself. And again, look at the glass half full. You're going to get through it. We always do. So this car, this virus is a sometimes fatal disease. It's usually not a fatal disease. Pandemic means it's all over the place, and, and that's what it is. We understand this family of viruses very well. This is related to two viruses we've seen in the last 20 years. They both successfully contained those viruses at early stage. That did not succeed with this virus, and it spreads very, very quickly. Now, people perceive disease-modifying treatments as a risk factor for COVID, they actually don't appear to be. They actually appear to be the opposite, but we have very little data. Your immunity eliminates the virus even without antibodies, but in some cases, the immunity actually is what damages other organs. And this happens with influenza and it happens with other kinds of viruses. We know that people can get through COVID without their MS getting worse. 
And so we assume that some of the immune elements, there are some immune elements that, that are called NK cells, which are actually good for MS. It may be that the NK cells are, are playing a big role in clearing these viruses, because when you have a lot of NK cells, the MS tend to do well. Antibodies clearly are not needed to clear the virus. And this is true of many viruses. This is true of the chickenpox virus and the herpes virus. Uh, you know, many viruses, uh, your body clears without antibodies. Antibodies are nice. They do give you some protection against other infection, but they are not necessary to clear a virus. Uh, understanding the, the, the biology of this virus may help us and understand it, but we're a long way from fully understanding that. So you may have seen a chart like this that was published earlier this year by an English group, um, which is very smart and tried to think through this. And I've got listed here uh, the, the, the medications uh, as, as to whether they're low, intermediate, or higher risk for changing how the immune system functions. Now, that may be a liability in the short term or long term for MS uh, a, a, or for COVID. Now, everybody is pretty much in agreement that most of the common first-line medicines that include the S1Ps, the fumarates, abagio, glutamoracetate, and interferon are probably very low risk. In fact, some of these may be actually be beneficial. Uh, we just don't have enough data. And that the second-line agent, Tysabri, are, are, are safe. No one has any questions about that. What they have questions about is the other medicines. And, and they're certainly, uh, we're not sure about Ocrevus and Casimpta, which is the new injectable medicine that's similar to Ocrevus. The, um, the good thing is, uh, the good thing is they're probably not too dangerous. Uh, there's a lot of data about this from rituximab in Europe. I, I should have put rituximab on here as well. Uh, although it's not approved in the United States, it's widely used in the world. Uh, is it safe to start? Well, it depends. Is it safe to continue? Well, it depends. Um, if you're at very high risk of immediate infection, I would say well, you can wait. You can do something else. This, this class of medicines wears off very slowly. But people usually started these medicines because they have very difficult MS. And the risk of your MS causing a permanent or a very serious problem goes up if you delay them, uh, if you delay starting them. And really continuing it is probably no different in terms of the changes in your immune system than if you've already had it. So uh, I, I'm not in agreement with these authors because I think if you've already had it, it's certainly not much different to get it again. And is it safe to start? Well, that depends on your MS, but most people take it because their MS is in control. Now, the ones that are really get difficult are the higher risk medications. And most people would say, yeah, stem cells, it's probably not a good idea to use stem cells after chemo and make somebody's immune system go away for a while, which is what that does. These other drugs are very short, maybe Clad and Lymtrata, you're talking about weeks of the immune system being mildly impaired. And so it, it, um, if you can isolate yourself, there's really no big liability of these. People have normal vaccine responses by a couple months into treatment, which means their immune system's working fine. So it's not, it's not anything. And we know these medicines have been around for 30 years, both these medicines. People don't melt when they get the flu or shingles or a, a cold sore. It doesn't go to hell in a handbasket. So it depends. It depends on whether people are safe and whether there's a need. So I would disagree with these authors who try, were very pedagogic in saying, well, we don't think this is safe. Well, the answer is it's always a risk benefit assessment. And, and that's what you need to do is, is think about risk benefits. If I can get my uh, slides to advance, there we are. All right. So um, the uh, transient immune weakness that you see with these stronger medicines is similar to pregnancy. Lymtrata and Mavenclad definitely have a transient immune weakness. It's a matter of weeks. 
ochre risk, well, it's a long-term weakness, and I don't think it changes that much if you continue getting it. As far as risk versus benefit, if you have mild MS, you probably aren't taking these medicines. If you have moderate MS, you have to make a decision with your doctor. If you have severe MS, you have a high liability for stopping or avoiding treatment. Now, in some cases, people have to get treated in a hospital and they may even have them have a COVID test before they go in, they test everybody. If your hospital is testing people for COVID prior to their infusions, that's great. That means you're not gonna get it there. Um, if you have COVID, you shouldn't get it for sure. You just put it off till you're better from COVID. After you're be all better from COVID, you're perfectly fine to get it. So if we wanted to draw a cartoon about COVID, this is the COVID. What is COVID? COVID is a tiny, tiny um, uh, virus. It's like a fragment of a cell. It's not a living organism, except that it can reproduce itself. This is a cell that's gonna get infected. It's called a pneumocyte, which means it's a lung cell. It's about a thousand times bigger than the virus. The virus attaches to a protein called ACE2 um, that is an important protein that's on many cells. And, these basically what a virus is is a package of rna or dna that gets into the cell and hijacks the cell's machinery to make more copies of itself if you have antibodies they can block the ability of the virus to connect to the cell that's how the virus does it's this spike protein uh, sticks to the cell and the cells tricked like a trojan horse into bringing the virus in and letting it be infected we have lots of kind of immune cells that are involved. Um, macrophages take out the trash. CD8 cells kill infected cells. Uh, CD4 cells get it going. B cells are the beginning of an immune response for, for making plasma cells that protect you in the long term. And there are other kinds of immune cells. Uh, some are like the CD4 and CD8 cells, but they're called NK cells. They kill viral, virally infected cells without being trained to do it. So the, all these are what's going on. We don't understand enough yet about this in, in uh, how COVID works, but we get we have cold viruses that are like this that people get, and they always get over them. The problem is the immune system can go crazy uh, trying to attack what's an overwhelming viral infection and damage other organs. I'm going to stop there and turn it back over to Stuart, and I'll let him decide what we do next. First off, I want to thank you. Yay, everybody, give Dr. Hunter a round of applause. Woohoo! Okay, awesome. We have questions. We have lots of questions. Can you please explain the treatment for tremors so tremors uh, tremors are different kinds okay there's tremors like this these are adrenaline okay uh, people have little little tremor like this this is adrenaline um and and it's 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 often called essential tremor uh because everybody has a little bit of it when it's bad it's like this you know you're trying to hold a cup or a pen and your hand shakes just a little bit, not so clumsy, just shakes. Um, those aren't necessarily due to MS. MS tremors are more like this. You try to touch your nose and it goes like this. That's a clumsy tremor, okay? Clumsy tremors are harder to treat. The first thing that you do, if you have a clumsy tremor, and I've got, um, is you get a weight on your wrist or your hand like this. And if you put a weight on your hand, it won't shake nearly as much. There's a really nice thing I like called weighted gloves. Amazon Gold's Gym weighted gloves. They go on the back of your hand. They're miraculous for small tremors. Um, they work really well. They cost 15 bucks on Amazon. Um, there are medications for tremor. The problem with the medications for tremor is most of them work like sedatives. Uh, clonazepam, which is a very hard medicine to stop and it's hard on your memory, works well. Great, thank you. What uh, can improve cognitive issues? I'm going to well, jump around that, a little bit. That's a good a good question. So, so uh, we have a lot of strategies to improve cognition. The first is you use your brain. The second is you use your legs. 
If you use your legs, you actually think much more clearly. In fact, even if you stand up, you think about 15% faster. Um, the, but it's, there's an amazing effect of physical exercise on cognition. It's so remarkable that it's the most effective treatment for Alzheimer's disease if people will exercise. Um, getting enough sleep is important. There are medicines that are stimulants if people are sleepy. Uh, we like armodafinil the best, what used to be called new vigil. It's, it doesn't have uh, restrictions on it, uh, like, uh, like the stronger amphetamine stimulants that actually don't work that great. Uh, the newer S1P medicines have evidence that they improve thinking. Um, I published a large paper with Jelinia showing that it improved mood. Uh, years ago, that's probably almost certainly due to thinking. And then, but the newer medicines actually show that they improve processing speed. Uh, Zaposia and Mason both improve processing speed, especially the more time that goes by, the more it improves. Why is that? We call it a gray matter effect because these are microscopic problems you cannot see on MRI in the brain. Um, you can't replace lost brain, but you can make it work better. And th these things are there. Uh, some people benefit from dalfamperdine, which used to be called Impera on their thinking. Um, you know, there's different things to try. Uh, if it's mainly a memory or mild perceptual problem, the medicine called Nepazil and the related medicines that are called cholinesterase inhibitors that are used for Alzheimer's disease often work. So all those are beneficial ways to look at memory. Right. Thank you. How can a person writes, everything is a person. Even though I write it, I say how something about I. It's not I. It's that person. How can I combat fatigue? So it depends on the kind of fatigue. If it's mainly sleepiness, you need to, you need to have your sleep looked at. If something's disturbing your sleep, you have a spouse that snores, if your dog is sleeping in your bed, if you sleep with the TV on, it's common sense. You stop that, okay? Um, if, you're, if you're not rested when you wake up in the morning, you almost certainly have a, have a sleep problem. You need to have a sleep study. If you are, if, you're, if your fatigue is more, much more prominent as the day goes on, and you may even get a second, um, uh, get a second uh, wind later in the evening, uh, you probably have MS fatigue. MS fatigue, you try to treat it. Usually, traditionally, we use amantadine first, then we use other stimulants um, like, like the armodafinil. I find that to be most helpful, although it's hard to get approved by insurance with a coupon. It's $40 a month. It can be refilled, and um, you, you know people will stay awake and concentrate better all day long. There's no perfect medicine for fatigue. Um, uh, people sometimes like stimulants. I'm not convinced that the stimulants work great. I will try people usually with Phentermine, which is a diet aid. It's really not very different from Ritalin. Uh, even tiny doses seem to help some people, and I usually start with tiny doses. More is not necessarily better. Side effects are often more irritability, uh, restlessness, racing heart. Um, and then there are medicines in our state. Uh, the state has changed the laws to where it's very, very hard to prescribe amphetamine stimulants for people. So uh, we are not uh, inclined to usually do that. So, so nowadays we try to avoid it. But there yeah, yeah. isn't a great fatigue strategy. Exercise, again, one of the best things for fatigue. All right, doctor, thank you very much for that answer. I have to let you know that we have like a lot of questions to ask and we're going to have to try to like make the responses as short as we can. So even if you have to ramble or cut out a few words, just um, I know you want to get out of there. You, you know, you're going to have to get I, home. I'm completely your... doing this off the cuff without preparation. So I'm trying to be comprehensive. That, that's good. But but we have a lot, a lot of questions and, and we have to get to our rural America questions, which are, I don't know, 40 questions away from right now. Right. Let me let me let me go to one that was asked online during this program. A person named Kevin writes, it used to be neurologists during an earlier initial clinical consult used to ask a question about tingly skin after taking a shower. Does anybody remember that? He asks, what was that about? 
What was the question and why was it, what was it meant to mean? Short answer, please. Heat sensitivity, a very common problem with MS. They used to, uh, they used to ask people if they got weak or had numbness after a hot bath or shower or getting outside in the heat. It's typical Great, for you. MS. It was a diagnostic question. Great. Next person asks, if there's a plant-based diet alone, if would a plant-based diet alone provide the same protection as an MS medication? It's, it, it, it's, it's very clear it does not. It's been the experiment has been done. And it is not uh, it is not effective. It makes you your cholesterol great and you lose weight, though. Great. Thank you. Will I naturally develop a resistance to my current medication? Uh, well, it depends on what people mean by resistance. Uh, a, 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 can people get worse when they're on medication? The answer is yes. And the reason is, is because MS in, in most cases, even with highly effective medicines, is not perfectly controlled. There, there, there is oftentimes a minor uh, progression or a, either events that are occurring that you don't notice. And at some point it becomes noticeable. So this is not a resistance. This is a lack of complete control. When you begin to notice things that are a problem, you need to talk to your doctor about options for controlling your disease more comprehensively. And there isn't a, a single approach that works for everybody. Everybody's different. It depends on what you've been on. You, you see a move away nowadays from the older frontline medicines, interferons, um, it towards newer, more highly effective medicines like the S1P agents, dimethyl fumarate or methyl fumarates. And, and IV medications. Great, thank you. Uh, next person, what can we do to get items covered like a go walk brace? Um, I'm not sure what she or he means by that. Um, so if you can explain any of that, um, some of the items are very expensive and they wanna know how to make things a bit more, how can the industry make things more functional for people with MS? So, so um, I think I know what they mean. It's it's this brace that uh, lifts your leg with your arm. Um, but there is uh, the problem is technology moves very slowly when it comes to disabled people. Um, someday they will take something and screw it in your head, and it will make your legs work. But that isn't anytime soon. Um, uh, the best thing is, is is if you have real mobility problems and you need to get out and do more, you get a really good wheelchair and you go to a wheelchair clinic to get it designed. You don't just buy one on the Internet. Um, the As far as walking, if you walk, you need to try to walk more. That If you stop walking regularly, you will your your muscles that lift your legs will get weak to the point you can't lift your leg. If you're sitting a lot, you need to be lifting your legs. You need to be like you're marching while you're sitting. If you're lying, you need to lift your legs off the bed. If you do not do that, you will become unable to walk. If you can't do that because you're MS, that's unfortunate. Um, and, and the old drug Ampira or Dalfampardine is the best medicine for making those limbs stronger if they're just not working well enough. Unfortunately, some people have seizures and can't take it. Okay, thank you. Next question, going back to bladder issues. Um, person would like to know what's the difference between a bladder stimulator and interstim? Uh, so a bladder stimulator, uh, well, the interstim, I'm trying to remember what an interstim, I think interstim is a bladder stimulator. And uh, I would, I recommend against them generally simply because I've never seen one where it worked well enough that we didn't want to take it out and it always got in the way of doing the kinds of MRIs we'd like to do. Okay. And, and there are many, many urologists who love to put them in and they just don't work that well for most people. Thank you for that. A person would like to know more about statins and how they're related to MS. Well, statins are actually anti-inflammatory drugs. That's part of how they prevent heart attack and stroke. They don't just block cholesterol production, which is what they were designed to do. But that pathway that makes cholesterol also makes the inflammatory signaling mediators. And this is why we think they work. 
Um, they, they don't, I mean, they're good for diabetes. They're good for Alzheimer's disease. They're good for preventing stroke. They're good for preventing heart attacks. If your bad cholesterol, your LDL is high, that's a good reason to use a statin. Some neurologists will have people start them for their MS. Um, high doses were what were used in the MS trial. Those are not trivial doses of these drugs. They require monitoring to be sure they don't irritate somebody's liver. Um, if people are generally healthy, they're very safe medicines. Um, the uh, many internists are very experienced at, at using them and can use them. Um, they greatly, greatly decrease progression of disability in, in, in a large clinical trial that was done in Great Britain. Someday we will have better information about doses. But the doses were like basically Lipitor at 80 milligrams, which is a very big dose. Okay, great. Thank you for that. So a few people are writing in that uh, they either were not seeing the slide deck, we're not seeing uh, other things going on. They want to know why they're not seeing. Well, I, I can only say that we do know that if you're looking at it on a phone, especially an iPhone, you cannot see the actual visual portion of this. But if you're looking at it on a laptop, you'd be able to see everything that was going on. That we have found in the past. We don't know why that happens, but it does. Um, okay, next, um, next we have a person that wants to know if she, she does not eat seafood is there another way that she could get omega-3? Yeah, well, well, uh, if you're allergic to seafood, um, the uh, then you shouldn't eat things that are derived from seafood, okay? But omega-3 is present in fish oil. It is present in anything that says omega-3. Um, uh, krill oil, if somebody's allergic to, uh, to certain fish, sometimes they can take krill oil. Krill is actually like micro shrimp. So if you're allergic to shrimp, don't try krill oil. Um, the, uh, there are many grains and nuts that have omega-3 and you can find, especially in health food stores or online, you can find omega-3 supplements that are not sourced from seafood. And, um, so, so, flax and pumpkin and and other grains have a lot of omega-3s you just have to look at it and what are you looking for you're looking for over a thousand milligrams a day of omega-3 all right thank you for that one now next i'm going to like sum up a whole lot of questions a lot of people are asking specifically about different medications the bottom line is, is what they're asking is if they've been on it for a number of years five years ten years seven years fourteen years um, those are the different numbers I'm seeing here, and they have had no new lesions, but that they're finding different things wrong, thinking less uh, processing slower, as well as showing weakness in the legs, as well as another person, um, something else to do with cognition. They want to know what they should be doing. Should they be staying on that medication, or should they be moving on to something else? Well, this is this is a very good question. And the answer is, are there benefits to switching around? And the answer is sometimes, and there's also liabilities, okay? You might run into a problem that was unexpected that's a side effect. Or you may have been better controlled on what you were taking before and you didn't realize how good it was. But uh, the, it's very, very hard to see. There is a very bad correlation between what you see on MRI and people's disability. Um, and people have disability because of multiple reasons uh, in, in the way the nervous system d doesn't function. And everybody declines. People without MS decline over years, many years when you look at them. So, so can what needs to be checked out if somebody comes in with a really bad cognition problem we do a sleep history we do an eeg uh, we look at their ms medicines if they're not on an s1p or or some other very highly effective drug we look at changing their medication to see if that help um but it's very important we'll get you have to do one thing at a time to see if it helps but there isn't um a one-size-fits-all solution for somebody who noticed things that are slowly getting worse. I will say that the best data has come out of the trials for Mazent, uh, which is not an easy drug to use. Uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, it's, it's seconded only to, to Gelinia, which is the, the most work to start for an oral medicine. 
But in the benefit, again, of these medicines is what doesn't happen. And in people who are very, very slowly worsening and aging as well, the benefit is the slope of the worsening. So you have a very difficult time appreciating the benefit of the medication. This med the, these medicines have been proven to be effective in, in clinical trials. And many of the things that the companies <clears throat> are not allowed to tell you, your doctor can find out by asking, but he may or may not take the initiative to do so. Okay, thank you for that. Next one I'm gonna group together are things to do with MS relapse. So questions tying them together. How do I know if I'm having a relapse? How do I know that I'm not having a relapse even though my, I'm having a lot of symptoms? And what kind of medications are there available for relapse? So that was one of the things that I reviewed was how we treat them. And trying to diagnose a relapse is very hard when somebody's not in front of me um, because the, what people notice is many times different than what I notice. Many times people complain about fatigue or pain and I don't know if they're having a relapse. We examine them and they're weak on one side. Ah, now I know they have a relapse. Um, some smaller people can be quite weak and not really notice it because they just kind of float down the hall. They don't have a lot of mass to control and they can they can walk just fine. Other big people, they can be a tiny bit weak and very disabled because they just can't move their 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 body around right. Um, some things are obvious. Your vision, you've got double vision or you've got blurred vision or you're, you're very, very dizzy, which doesn't have to be an MS relapse. It can be normal dizziness that happens to more people. Uh, they have a tremor. They have a clumsy hand. They have a, they have a weak hand. They have a clumsy leg or a weak leg or both legs or they can't stand up. They're numb from the waist down or they're tingling in, in their hands really severely. Um, it may be a small relapse. You know, um, if it doesn't get in your way of doing things, we tell people to watch it because we hate to give people high dose steroids if we don't need to, because most of these things that are mild will calm down. And so we just observe them. Uh, but, but people who need to be treated, we treat them because we don't want it to get any worse. If you come in and you're not walking right uh, or you've got weak limbs, we're usually going to treat you with high dose steroids unless there's an alternative that needs to be used. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to switch away from the actual things specifically about MS right now to get into some of the other questions um, concerning our topics, one of which is, person writes, I'm currently on disability. Her husband will be retiring next year. We see ourselves having to move to a less expensive area, but MS care won't be as available as it is where we are now in the city. Can you offer any advice that may help with my fear and stress? Drive to the city and drive to the city, stick with the doctors who have done you good care. Um, the uh, It's really worth the trouble. It's really worth the trouble. It's really worth the trouble if you've got a good center that knows how to manage MS. Um, you can ask around and see if there's somebody in that area, but, but there is no substitute for a doctor who's skilled at managing MS. There are lots of people if you see a new doctor and he says, well, I don't think your MS is bad or I don't think you need to be on medication, go to another doctor. Don't follow that advice. It's almost always wrong, you know, and it, it, it's really quite amazing, alarming, uh, the laissez-faire attitude that many neurologists have. It's about half a neurologist really you don't want to see with MS. This is true across the world. This is just, you know, there are about half that got the stuff and about half that don't. And so uh, doctor's advice is cheap, especially when you're on Medicare. It's cheap. Okay, thank you. Now going to questions from rural America, which was where this program was intended to be today. We were supposed to be in Paducah, Kentucky, if you recall. Um, unfortunately, things didn't work out, right? All right, so the first one is, how do I source the right people for MS treatment support if they live in a small area and and there's another one here that says finding and getting assistance for my needs is hard when you live on a farm in rural America. What are your suggestions? Well, I deal with a lot of people from Paducah, Kentucky, and I'll tell you, uh, you know, having somebody who knows what the resources are in your area, I may send one of them to one eye doctor there. I may send them to another urologist there. I may see them, I may treat some of the things, I may, uh, you know, if they need something that's really specialized, 
I may have them see somebody in my area where I know who the resources are. Um, you know, there's nothing that's close when you live in rural America. You're two or three hours away from, from specialty care in many cases. The advantage is your expenses are a lot lower living there. Um, you know, I will say that people who try to do it by on the telephone or leaving messages or just telemedicine, it just doesn't work very well. Um, you know, you can't make progress doing that. You need to see a doctor regularly. If you think you're going to go down there one year and get 10 problems taken care of in one visit, you're going to be very disappointed because it just isn't going to happen. This is too complicated. You, you know, if you can even find a couple doctors between your internist and a good neurologist who can do most of your care, you're doing great. But you go to an academic center and they'll send you to one doctor to deal with your headache, one doctor to deal with your spasticity, one doctor to deal with your bladder, one doctor to deal with your MS, one doctor to deal with your seizures. You know, you'll be seeing seven or eight doctors every every month. Uh, but you know, if your problem needs that to get under control, that's what you need to do. Thank you. Next person writes, getting my infusions and driving to a cancer center or a hospital that's three and a half hours away and arranging for child care for the entire day has become difficult and costly. Home infusions are not available in her area or his area. Uber and Lyft do not serve their area, their rural community at all. What suggestions might you have? Well, there, there is an infusion uh, that's called Limtrata. That's five doses in a row. They'll pay. They'll get you assistance for a hotel uh, that's given the very first time, and then a year later, three more, and then you don't routinely get it. That's what I would say. If you've got difficult MS and you need regular infusion care, Limtrata is a great option. Mavenclad is a great option. You don't have to have uh, IV therapy at all. It's very similarly effective. Uh, S1Ps like uh, like uh, uh, Jelinia and uh, Zaposia are very effective medicines. The um, the as far as IVs go, Ocrevus is every six months. There's now a medicine, uh, Kesempta, that was just approved last week that is like Ocrevus. That's a self injection every month. So you can cut your visits if you're on, I assume you're on Tysabri if you're really having a hard time. You can cut your visits uh, tremendously uh, by, by using one of these alternative methods. You need to talk to your physician about what's appropriate. Great, thank you. Next person writes, how do I find out about financial assistance programs offered to help people with MS? So, so uh, it depends on what kind of assistance. If, if you've got a commercial drug, the companies will help you if you don't have Medicare or TRICARE. If you have Medicare and TRICARE, you have to go to a charity to get that assistance. Sometimes a specialty pharmacy will have access to assistance fund for you if you're on Medicare. Um, the, the best place to go, if you don't know, is needymeds.org. Needymeds.org, you put your medicine in and, and they will tell you which companies could help you with, with it. Um, the, as far as other benefits, there are some very limited resources. You know, it depends on your state and your locale and your insurer. Um, the, there is uh, nobody who's going to pay for somebody to come out and, and do your laundry for you. You know, that you're going to have to use your community and family resources. As far as helping you with everything else, uh, you know, there may be some assistance in home health aids and in, in some plans. Usually there's not, you know, it's it's very frustrating if people have limitations. And and just to add one thing to that, um, if anybody can contact the National Multiple Sclerosis Society or the MS Association of America or even the MS Foundation, they each have social workers. Okay, or nurses that work with them, and you can find out what's available for your area with regard to treatment support, places to go, others to find out about, and and all the things that Dr. Hunter is speaking about. So it's really easy if you can, you know, if you can't find it on the internet yourself, you can always call one of those three major MS organizations to 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 speak with somebody to help you get those answers. Do you agree, Dr. Hunter? 
Yes, uh, it's it varies. The it, it very those organizations have very different programs from place to place. So it's it's sometimes uh, very useful and sometimes very uh, not useful. Some of the MS centers have extraordinary support for these kind of people. We don't in our area have that kind of support. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. Now let's cycle back. And and just so everybody knows, I am going to be getting to some COVID questions, but. Um, I just want to get rid of everything else first because that's going to probably take a little bit more. But yet we only have another 15 minutes to get all this done because then we have Paul Pelland. And Paul's got a sensational story that I want you to hear because it really helps to tie everything in together. And it's going to make you a stronger person listening to his 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 story. All right. Well, all I'll, right. I'll, let, I'll let you get to Paul in 10 minutes because that's when I got I to get my daughter. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You know what that means? You got to really, really shorten your answers, right? Okay. Next one. What is the protocol for switching from one DM from to a new DMD from DMT from Tysabri? By the way, back in the day, that, we did that's call a them really DMDs. big subject, and and so we're gonna. I I will come back if you have time at the end. I have to be gone for fifteen minutes, and then I'll that's be back. True. That's uh, true. Uh, yeah, in ten minutes, let's let's hand that. We can to cycle the back end. on that. Somebody's got to remind me in the background there that I have to go back to Dr. Hunter later. <laughs> all right, great. We have our we have our crew here, right? All right. The next question is: um, With this pandemic being so prevalent, should I be paying attention to boosting my immune system in the coming months? Um, take 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 vitamin D, omega three. Treat your health problems. Uh, you know, try to avoid getting infected and, uh, you know, generally the stay, keep your MS under control. That's all, all we can do. And you're not going to boost your immune system any other way than being healthy. How about just that we have MS and we already have boosted immune systems? Uh, well, well, you know, people with MS are different and as they get older, some of them have really crummy immune systems, but you know, so it's hard to, hard to give generic advice. Okay. This is an important question. Is there any help for secondary progressive MS? My doctor took me off my MSK medication. Now why? Um, uh, I would say that's usually a mistake, it, it, but not always. If, if somebody um, uh, if somebody has very many years of complete stability and they have advanced age and they've not changed in 15 or 20 years, it's fine to see you off your medicine. Oftentimes, this is a disaster. About 40% of the time, it's a disaster to stop people's medicine. There is this, this old uh, myth that MS burns out, and MS does not burn out. It does slow down as people get older. If you have any kind of changes on an MRI or any, any kind of relapse-like events in the last 10 years, it's usually a, a disaster to stop him, stop your MS treatment. And you should be closely observed. A doctor just says, oh, you don't need treatment anymore. You're over 55. He's either misinformed or very laissez-faire about your health. Thank you for saying that. All right, next one is uh, another important one about SPMS. Um, if diagnosed with SPMS and all the MRIs show no new lesions, no active lesions, but my body is getting weaker, especially in the legs. What should this indicate? There are several things out there now for active SPMS. Would any of them work for inactive SPMS? Well, you probably have, uh, you probably, if you've had anything happen in the last five years, you have active SPMS. And Mazent was actually tested in people with inactive uh, SPMS as well that hadn't had relapses in the last couple of years. And um, the government did not allow them to put inactive SPMS on the label, but it, it what it does, it slows things down. Ocrevus probably does this. Limtrata probably does this. Tysabri probably does this. It doesn't matter which one you use as much as that you're on treatment. Um, all these things help. Are you going to notice the, what you cannot notice that you're going downhill more slowly. And that's what's going to happen when you have SPMS. Um, Limtrata will, in an occasional person, produce a very miraculous improvement. Um, it's certainly going to help you. Every treatment is going to help you keep your arms. When you have one bad leg, that's all it's going to take to get you off your feet. 
and okay. and it tends to get worse. Controlling the spasticity is very important. Many people under think that they're getting more disabled from their MS when they're getting more disabled from the spasticity, and that requires some good care. I would see also a physical medicine if your neurologist doesn't treat a lot of spasticity. Thank you for that. Now, let's get in some quick COVID questions before you have to leave. And then for everybody that's on here, right, please know that Paul is going to speak. Paul, we're going to do some questions for. Dr. Hunter will be back again because we have a lot of questions still to do. So he's going to come back online, all right? And um, so that's probably going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of about, I'm going to say, what time is it now? I'm going to say it's going to be somewhere around 825 or 830, all right? And he'll be back on to we can continue with more of these questions. Okay, so, but for the meantime, let me ask you this. What are the neurological symptoms associated with COVID? Well, the neurological true? symptoms, people feel fluish. You know, they feel tired. Um, they can be a little confused. People with MS, when they have a fever, they're usually very confused. Um, the, uh, but in general, there's not as many neurological symptoms. Is the prominent symptoms are usually respiratory impairments. You know, cough, the cough, sneeze. You know, those is, is sore throats sometimes. But um, the it's more fatigability and confusion, and that's when people talk about neurological symptoms. That's what they mean. And uh, but when you have a virus, you usually feel terrible with MS. In fact, people with MS sometimes get out of their head when they have a fever. Great. Thank you for that. Um, it's not that I want it, but I'm just saying thank you for that. All right. How many um, patients? No, let's skip that one for now. Um, being an MS, or can I protect myself better besides listening to the CDC? Well, um, I don't know the CDC always gets it right. Uh, you know, the evening news usually doesn't get it right. But the best thing you can do, keep your distance, keep your hands clean, um, you know, use a mask when you're out in public. Um, the, uh, you know, that's all you can do. It works for just about any virus or communicable disease. I mean, it's not transmitted by mosquitoes, it's transmitted by other people. Uh, I've had people who are very careful who told me they have no idea how they got uh, COVID. Doctors who who have MS who protect themselves and uh, they they like went to the supermarket. They got COVID. Well, you can't help it. I mean, if you, you, some people are just going to have bad luck, but in general, if you use protective equipment, you stay away from people. You aren't going to get it. It's just the way it is. Okay. Next one, and I, and then I know you got to go, but I'm going to make you answer this one, all right? All right, person writes, I recently read something that if you take elderberry extract and have COVID-19, it could be fatal as you get a cytokine storm and die. If someone does not have the coronavirus but has MS, do you think that they can take elderberry as a preventative? Um, I, I'm not going to answer it because I have no idea, and, and elderberry is usually not a problem for people with MS, so that's all I can tell you. Okay. Before we get into any COVID questions, I want to back up to people that were asking questions online. What is the normal dosage or what is a typical dosage of alpha lipoic acid? The most commonly used, and it's usually just called lipoic acid now for short. Uh, chemical name is alpha lipoic acid. The, it's, it's usually given as 600 milligrams, which is uh, 300 milligram capsules, two of them twice a day. Okay, great. Thank you for that. All right. Next one was, okay, next one was, do you have any idea how many patients in the United States have contacted COVID? Yeah, it's it's uh, close to 2 million people have probably had it. In the United you know, probably, States? Yeah, in the U.S. It's probably oh, two or three million. No, no, no. But the question was, how many MS patients in the U.S. Oh, have MS patients. Well, I would assume the MS patients aren't much different than everybody else, and so, you know, it's around it's around two percent of of U.S. Uh, population has probably had this medicine, had this virus, 
So, so the MS patients are around one uh, percent of the white women. So it's somewhere around one percent of of that. So if you take one percent of a couple million people, it's probably a hundred thousand. You know, in that okay, it, in, uh, ten thousand, about ten thousand MS patients probably. That's that's quite a few. The MS patient registry. It's not on here. The, excuse me. The Covey MS registry. It's not a, anyone's question, but I just want to ask you, if you know anything about it, can you let the audience know about this, please? Sure, sure. It's done It's done out of Washington University and with the Consortium of Multiple Sclerosis Centers. Uh, Dr. Ann Cross is the one who's done the most. Um, you know, they're, 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 the problem is with any registry is there's a lot of reporting bias for more sicker people. Um, you know, I would say, you know, I probably care for 1,500 people with MS, probably 10 patients in my practice have had COVID, and in in none of them was it very serious infection, uh, although they were ill. Uh, the person who had the worst course actually got better from the COVID and then got a blood clot in their legs, which is a recognized afterwards complication, and that's probably the most serious one I've had. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, the next thing is, um, are there any MS drugs that are being tested, especially for the use to combat COVID? Yeah, well, the, the National Institutes of Health in the United States is testing Rebif in combination with another uh, approved antiviral drug, drug Disavir, uh, which has modest benefits. And uh, so, so Rebif is actually the same medicine your body makes uh, the hormone to fight uh, fight viruses, and it's a very large dose of antiviral effect. The problem is, you it's the effect of interferon, uh, which is what Rebif and many of the similar medicines like beta seron and and Plegrity are, is um, is very very early in a viral infection. It contains the viral infection early to marshal. Uh, other immune resources. By the time somebody's really sick, you know, we don't know if those strategies work. For example, hydroxychloroquine uh, is a very powerful antiviral uh, agent. It completely shuts down the replication of the virus. It does not make people miraculously better. And this is true of medicines we have for the flu, you know, they shut down the flu replication, uh, Tamiflu, it has a very modest effect. It, it looks like hydroxychloroquine, if it has an effect, it's a fairly modest one, um, you know, and who it works for. We're just not clear on because when you take all comers, it's hard to show there's any benefit. Sure. Thank you for that. OK, next up. What are the um, is there any. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> is there any um, long term effects or longevity? of the coronavirus and multiple sclerosis together? Uh, well, the answer is we don't know. Uh, people do have cognitive complaints that go on for some period of time. So there's a, uh, there's a concept called neuroinflammation. When the body is stressed, the brain gets inflamed in a way that the immune cells that are resident in the brain activate. This happens with head injuries. It happens with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. High blood pressure, uh, high cholesterol, uh, diabetes—it, it, you know—and and these states are not that different from MS. So it's not—it would not be extraordinary for some patient to tell me that they feel worse since COVID. When people get mono, they feel very bad for for many months afterwards uh, or years. Uh, so we don't have any any well well run careful analyses. We just know people say that they don't feel back to normal months later. Okay. Next, um, as far as it's concerned, how much do you think? How much longer do you think people are going to need to steer clear of large gatherings? Such as a wedding. Um, I, I, I would conservatively estimate this isn't going to go on for about another year uh, before the effectiveness of a vaccine and the number of people who've been infected bring the transmission rate down adequately. The if you look at the 1917 influenza outbreak, it went on for about three years, uh, and and that's probably although it affected mainly younger people. That's a pretty similar uh, analogy. It's the closest one we have, and um, so so I can't 
And, and I know it's annoying if you have a drug company program because the drug companies won't let doctors talk like this. The opinion, you know, there are a lot of opinions. You ask six neurologists uh, a question and you'll get 10 answers. So all, all I can do is say it's worth what you pay for it in terms of advice. But I, I think it's going to go on at least it's going to be March or April before the rate of infection comes down. What you're seeing right now after the peak they have flattened the curve. What they've done is made a flat curve. It's gonna continue at a steady rate of new infections that recognizes the equilibrium of our measures to try to prevent it. But you can't keep everybody locked up. The poor kids have to go to school. And uh, we're able to identify infected people. We're not able to identify people who have been infected previously unless we happen to test them during the infection. Okay, getting away from COVID, thank you for that response. But getting away from COVID, what can you tell us about the PEG test? Which test? PEG. PEG? EGG? Peg. No, P-E-G. PEG. I'm not sure what the PEG test is. Okay, then we'll skip over that one for now. Sorry. Okay. All right, not a problem. That's because you're from Franklin, Tennessee and not the big city. Well, well, it may be something I'm familiar with, but just not by that term. Um, okay. All right. We'll speak about that later. Okay. It's where they put pegs in the board to try to see the cognitive rate of somebody putting down something systematically in different That's spots. That's called a nine-hole peg test. <laughs> peg test. <laughs> we write in a, a nine HPT, and, and we write it as it's your dominant hand or your non-dominant hand. Now, okay. that we know a lot about. We do a lot in MS. It's actually a very good measure of people's performance. Uh, it's better, actually, than a stopwatch for your legs. You can go online to YouTube. Uh, there's, a, there's a hashtag think hand that's out of Britain uh, where they actually uh, they had uh, paper uh, tests made. But most uh, most MS neurologist office have one of these peg tests. You can request it. It takes about 15 minutes to do the test. Uh, depends on how slow people's hands are. Um, but it is a very reliable test for hand function, and and it's simple. And we use it for that. In fact, the first medicine ever that was shown to work in progressive MS was minus antra. It was uh, excuse me, methotrexate. 25 years ago, and it was shown that it worked by with the nine hole peg test. Great. See, it's called a peg test. It's called the nine hole peg test. Yeah. Okay. You, you, everybody has shortened versions of everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next. Um, next. By the way, for everybody that is online, I want to do thank you for being online. Please know that. This entire event is being recorded as well, so it will go up onto our YouTube channel. I can't say if it's going to happen in the next few days, but it will be on there at least within 10 days. All right, I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll stay safe and say 10 days. Okay, so um, you'll be able to see it at that time again. Now, going forward, though, if anybody continues to have questions, please type them in online, and I'll be able to uh, answer these. All right, or I'm not going to answer them. I'm going to tell them, and the doctor's going to answer them. But we have a couple more that are remaining for now, and that is, can you tell us the difference of the different vitamin D3, the vitamin D products, including vitamin D3? So, so basically, vitamin D, uh, there is no vitamin D1, technically. <laughs> so there's vitamin D2, which is vitamin D, and vitamin D3, which is vitamin D. And um, the vitamin D2 is the kind of vitamin D that's made from plants. And vitamin D3 is the kind of vitamin D that's made in animals. And that's because the sterols are slightly different. So in people, vitamin D3 is made whenever the UVB uh, hits your skin, the UVA, excuse me, hits your skin from sunlight. Uh, sun lamps uh, don't have UVA. Um, UVA gives you skin cancer, UVB gives you skin cancer, UVA gives you vitamin D. If even with, with sunscreen on, if sun hits your skin, you make vitamin D, lots of it, lots of it. And instantly, 
Um, it's it's just basically from UV light hitting the steroid molecule. And in humans, it's made from, believe it or not, our friend cholesterol. All right, cholesterol becomes vitamin D. You have more than enough cholesterol, you don't have to eat cholesterol to get vitamin D. Uh, from, But you can make vitamin D also from uh, mushrooms that they expose to UV light. And that's how they used to make it until they got better at synthesizing it with chemistry. And now they just make vitamin D3. So it takes a little bit more vitamin D2 than D3 to get the same effect, but it's not a big difference. So vitamin D2 was called ergosterol and vitamin D3 is called cholecalciferol. And they used to use them in units. They're moving towards listing them in micrograms, which is the more modern way. And so most people with vitamin D need somewhere between 60 and 125 micrograms a day. Some people need less, some people need more. If you're taking it regularly, we recommend you get your level checked, which is actually a level for 25 hydroxy D3. You get it checked in the winter when it's at its lowest because it takes months to be used up. In about six weeks, your vitamin D level usually drops by half if you get no sunshine or take no supplement. Okay, thank you. Next question um, has to do with the insurance industry. How do MS patients afford their very expensive medications? They are often tier four and require 25% co-payment, more than $1,000 a month when we already pay $1,200 a month in premium and have very high deductibles. Do you have an answer for that? Yeah, you're lucky. If it's a brand name drug and you're on a commercial insurer, Obamacare or uh, you have insurance through the workplace. If the uh, if the insurance company approves the drug, your copay will usually be rebated or covered nearly completely by the manufacturer of the drug. All right, it's a wonderful thing in the United States. And until the president manages to deliver on making the drugs the same cost here as they are in the rest of the world, uh, you know that's a great deal. The problem is people who have no insurance, they, the company, uh, the, the manufacturer will usually just give them the drug. If they're underinsured and they have Medicare, unfortunately, the government, the Department of Justice, believe it or not, has interpreted the laws that Congress has written in such a fashion that they cannot assist you with your copays. In fact, they just fined one of the manufacturers of MS a, a billion dollars because they assisted people on Medicare with their copays just when they were in transition from commercial insurance to to Medicare. In the same year, they got assistance. They got it for a few months after their insurance changed. They fined the manufacturer one billion dollars. What do you think that does to drug innovation and education? It destroys it. Write your congressman, tell them to give them a safe harbor for helping people with their Medicare copays. The only reason that this happens is because Congress won't fix it. And it falls under what's called the anti-kickback provisions of the Medicare legislation. So, so basically the government says that if somebody's giving you money who who makes you uh, makes you uh, makes medicine so that you can get it through a federal program? They're kicking money back to you, and so it's fraud, and and so they penalize these manufacturers. It's very bad. Um, what is your solution? Your solution is you have to go to a third party charity, and and it, go to needymeds.org. You will see the list of these companies. The problem is everybody will get approved for assistance for practical purposes. The problem is it's like a game show trying to get the money. You have to call every morning and say, do you have money for me today? Because you'll get approved, but you won't get money. And one day you call up and they say, we've got money for you. And boom, you just got $4,000. Boom, just like that. And your Medicare copay is funded for another year. And, and that applies to all your medications in any MS medicine that is approved by your insurer. Um, your insurer does have to approve the medicine and they will have their own laundry list of things they want you to use before you do that because they get under the table many time money 
from from the the uh, manufacturer, which they require the manufacturer to give them, or they will not list their medication on their plan. You know, uh, politics are trying to stop that, but right now it's legal highway robbery. Uh, we can't do anything about it. But you can be very persistent. Your doctor can be persistent with what they think you need. But the best thing, meanwhile, is to try other drugs. And so, because if you try enough things, you will eventually get to the ones that that you need. Um, and what's really important is that you write a you you fill a prescription with the drug. Once you do that, it it takes the shackles off your doctor. If you if you don't fill it, then your doctors can't get things done for you. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks and for that answer. Samples don't count. Samples don't get, count. I hope you don't get in trouble with the company that cost got fined a billion dollars yeah well well that's okay they had to stop stop working with physicians that was part of the deal they had to give up positions and i hear the black helicopters Stuart. yeah i'm sure i'm sure so all right one last question persons persons want to know how to two different questions one wants to know how to reverse the damages the other one wants to know how to fix the myelin uh, well, fixing myelin is part of reversing damages. Exactly. The, the number one thing, get on treatment early. Stay on treatment. Don't stop treatment. Get stronger treatment. If, if you're still having new relapses or MRI lesions or you're getting worse, uh, talk to your doctor. The medicines, the highly effective MS medicines, all are associated with improvements. And you can see them, whether that improvement is going to be enough to make whatever you think needs to be better, better. That's not clear. But I'll tell you, with highly effective medicines, I can see on the long term, I tell people they're either going to get better or they get worse because I see that happen. Even if the disease isn't controlled, it helps protect them. And it's, it's what you're trying to do is wait out the MS for your life and keep your legs working and on your feet. And I have people who I've had secondary progressive MS for 25 years, and I call it secondary regressive MS because they're actually better now than they were 20 years ago now, 20 years ago, treating their MS aggressively, treating their spasticity. They're very active. Being physically as active as possible really makes a difference. Stretching your limbs to keep the spasticity down makes a huge difference. Controlling your spasticity, moving while you're even while you're sitting, lifting your legs makes a huge difference. Taking care of your health, controlling your blood pressure, your diabetes, your cholesterol, and 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 and, and God help us if you're still smoking. I'm sorry, you gotta get off tobacco. It is it is like air pollution times a hundred. It completely activates the immune system. You will not keep walking if you smoke tobacco. It's a fact of life. We've known it for a long time. Um, vaped nicotine is far, far safer than tobacco. Uh, you need not worry about the safety of vaporized nicotine and or or about uh, Chantix, which is uh, trivial, trivial in terms of its risk. And if you haven't tried it and gotten off tobacco, if you quit before, you can quit again. You know, you've got to get off tobacco. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that. And so I want to just say, again, say thank you to Dr. Hunter, again to Dr. To Dr. Paul. I want to say to Paul. It was Pellin. a Tysabri question we kicked down the road about we switching. Oh, yeah. Well, then you could tell me about the Tysabri. So we're not saying goodbye yet, everybody. That was going to be a long answer. So go ahead. You, well, you what I want to say is the first thing is a lot of data has been looked at with going from Tysabri to interferon and Copaxone. And uh, first of all, you don't want to go from Tysabri to nothing. It's dangerous, dangerous to interrupt Tysabri because it's one of the drugs that's associated with severe rebounds in activity because all these nasty cells are still circulating in your bloodstream. And when the blockade wears off, the immune cells are still really hopped up and Tysabri does hop up your immune cells. This is one of the problems it has. Uh, it, it's not a problem unless you stop it. Um, but, but most people transition people to rapidly effective, more effective drugs. The most popular drugs are Fingolimod and Abagio in the short term. Uh, other ones that probably work, the Tecfidera 
and Ocrevus and Lemtrata. But you want to time these to start while your Tysabri is still working when possible. Um, you know, so it, it very close to the time of the last dose, you always want to have an MRI scan uh, when you're finishing Tysabri and make sure that you don't have any signs of PML that might be adversely affected. And then your PML risk is different from person to person your physician can tell you. But the person who's JC virus positive has 1% per year of getting PML. It's a huge, huge risk. Okay, so the person that asked the question about switching to a new DMT from Tysabri also wrote that some neuros use solimedril incrementally while switching and some don't. Is there a standard protocol to prevent rebound relapse from the reconstitution? Yeah, you start a medicine right away. You don't wait till the Tysabri wears off. You start, you can start anything you can get done. Your doctor many times has samples of certain medicines. Nobody would worry about it for practical purposes as long as you have an MRI and don't have PML. There's no reason to let the Tysabri wear off before you stop. You don't need to give steroids. If somebody winds up off Tysabri and you need to do something right away, you can certainly give them a dose of steroids every month until you can get them on something else working. But the whole idea is not to do these things unplanned. You have a plan. You can start a Baggio. You can start. Uh, you can start uh, Gelinia or Zaposia very easily. You, you can start dimethylfumarate, uh, Tecfidera. Um, te everybody's gonna. Let me tell you, your insurance company beginning next year is gonna require everybody is taking Tecfidera. You might as well take it and see how it, how it does because it, you're going to be told, no matter what you're on, that you need to take Tecfidera, they're not going to approve it. Um, you might as well get it out of the way as the very first drug, because it's going to be generic, it's going to be cheaper every six months, it's going to be the first cheap therapy for MS that's FDA approved. Okay, thank you very much for your responses, thank you very much for everything you put in to tonight's program, for doing your, the beginning, coming back and tying up the end all right we just want to thank you for putting in all this time i want everybody to again remember please that this event was sponsored by sanofi genzyme genentech novartis bristol myers squibb all right we want to thank our our production team here this is orlando production he does he's been working with us now for about 10 years i mean it's pretty incredible we have over 600 um, he, uh, 600 different videos on our YouTube channel. Um, we now have different segments of it that you could click on to see the different types of series that we're doing and, and just, you know, watch the different programs concerning those different labels or those different topics. All right. And um, again, this is an MS Views and News program, and we are the leaders in providing online educational programs. And we do hope to see you with our future events. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Bye bye.